This is a production from the Takedown Sports. What's up, y'all? T Ron31 here from the Takedown Sports. I'm here with J Bot the Great, and this is another episode of The Last Word. We got a bunch of topics to hit today, so what's coming up? We'll be covering all of the NBA playoff games from the past week, and once again, we'll discuss whether or not the NBA has an injury problem. All right, sounds great. So we'll be starting with the Phoenix Suns sweeping the Denver Nuggets. So last Friday, Nuggets and the Suns played in Denver for game three and Phoenix won 116 to 102 behind Devin Booker's 28 points, Chris Paul's 27 points, six rebounds and eight assists. Uh, Jokic put up 32 points and Monte Morris put up 21, Will Barton with 14 and Michael Porter Jr. with 15, but Aaron Gordon putting up four points in 36 minutes probably killed him in that game. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good assessment. That's this guy comes in from a big trade. He's supposed to be one of your, you know, one of your big producers, kind of like he was in Orlando for most of the time. And he plays 36 minutes and puts in four points. That's just not what you need out of a guy like Aaron Gordon. And that's a good good way to, to take a quick trip home. Quick, quick trip home. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and act like Aaron Gordon is supposed to be scoring 50 points a game, but there's absolutely no reason why he should only score four points in 36 minutes. Um, not a single assist, four rebounds, so I mean, I guess that's all right there, but it's it's just unacceptable when you play that many minutes. You play the second most minutes on the team, second only to Jokic himself, the MVP, of course, and you only score four points. You got to do a lot better than that, but I will give a lot of credit to Chris Paul, of course, you know, when Chris Paul scores darn near 30 points, you're probably going to win. Devin Booker put up 28, of course. Uh, Jay Crowder, he came in double digits. Michael Bridges, DeAndre Aiden with 15 rebounds. So another total team effort from the Suns. And they went up 3-0, and it was looking like Denver was pretty much done. And, and they were, because in game four, <laughs> They lost that as well, 125 to 118. Uh, and Jokic ended up getting ejected from a flagrant two. Uh, he ended up slapping campaign right in the face. But <laughs> truthfully, it didn't really look like it hit him in the face um, dead on. But either way, he got ejected. The Nuggets lost. Uh, Chris Paul, 37 points. Devin Booker, 24 points and 11 rebounds. Another total team effort there. And the Suns completed the sweep in four. Yeah, I'm not sure if I would call the uh, the foul and campaign a flagrant two, but I mean, it, he got called for the ejection. He did play 28 minutes. If he may have played the whole game, they might have been able to salvage a win out of that. Been down three one. Uh, I mean, they only lost, but by you know a, a small margin. But at, at the same time, I think the Suns are ready to get out of Denver and rest up for the next round. And I mean, Jokic's ejection definitely would have a big effect on it, on them. But once again, you have Aaron Gordon played 33 minutes, put up eight points. And so like, you just need more production out of your guys and you can't rely on one guy. Like I know he was the MVP, but you have to have more than just him doing things. Yeah, I mean, once Jokic got ejected, obviously everybody else has to step up. Uh, Will Barton, he finished with 25. Morris finished with 19. Michael Porter Jr. with 20. But as you said, Aaron Gordon only finished with eight points. He did get four assists and six rebounds, but that's still not good enough. Um, Aaron Gordon is supposed to be a star, uh, not superstar level, but at least star level, very good player, all-star caliber. I mean, what what was that? I mean, you're just not, you got to do better than that. You're not going to be able to help your team win if you only put up eight points as a guy that plays 30 plus minutes each night. Um, now again, Chris Paul, scores 37 points, you're probably <laughs> going to win the game anyway. But still, I do appreciate that they didn't die after Jokic went out, though. Mm -hmm. um, they could have easily just said, forget about it. 
you know, we don't, we're, we're, we're going to lose anyway, but they did fight to the end. Um, but it didn't really matter. I do want to want to shine a little light on uh, Fetuno Campato on the, of the Nuggets. I mean, he did, you know, small things throughout the series. Not as he did. Uh, what I wanted to say was he did kind of outplay Aaron Gordon on a lot less minutes. But I think he'll be a, a very good player next season. He kind of had his breakout this season in some ways. He obviously wasn't like a twenty point per game averaging guy, but he came out and and really tried to fire up the team. But yeah, Chris Paul comes out, drops thirty seven in this game. 37, 7, and 3. And you're, you're not losing that game behind Paul doing that. Like, there's no chance. Yeah, I think the Nuggets, I wouldn't expect them to sweep at all. Uh, I thought that was going to be a competitive series. But there was always the feeling like the Nuggets don't have Jamal Murray. How far could they actually go? I didn't think that if they did beat the Suns in you know, like 6 or 7, they would be able to get past the conference finals to the NBA finals uh, without Jamal Murray coming back. It doesn't matter because they didn't even win a single game of the series to extend it. So I guess it's just another what if as far as injuries go in the playoffs this season. You know, if Jamal Murray had been there, what would they have looked like? Yeah, I mean, that's a big what if. I'm sure they would have been a lot more competitive. Maybe pulled the series out. I'm not really sure, especially considering they got swept. It kind of seems like him coming back with maybe just extended a game or two. But I mean, yeah, another big what if for the season's playoffs because he's their he's their number two guy, and you have your number two guy out for a whole series against a team like this it makes a big difference, and clearly it did. I don't think anybody thought that uh, Jokic as the MVP would be swept away. Uh, he's like only one of like four to end up getting swept, so unlucky really. But they'll probably be back stronger next season. Yeah, I would say so. They they did get away with. Jamal Murray not being there in the first round against Portland. And even then, Portland pushed them to the brink almost. So we probably should have figured, you know, <laughs> if they don't have Jamal Murray for the entirety of the series here and they're going up against the number two seed in the West, they're probably going to get out of there pretty fast. Now, going forward, we got some news just yesterday, which would be uh, Wednesday for us, that Chris Paul is out indefinitely being placed in NBA health and safety protocols. And we further found out that he did test positive for COVID-19. So we really don't know what's going to be happening now. Uh, we're not sure if he's going to be available for the first game of the Western Conference Finals or not. Chris Paul is the unluckiest player <laughs> in NBA history, at least as far as timing of injuries and things like that. But the playoffs, I mean, he carries a team on his back. And you think this is the year Paul gets his ring and something like this happens. Now the Suns could still do it. But I think that if they were to have to play a whole series against either the Jazz or the Clippers without Chris Paul, that they might be outmatched. They need his, his offensive facilitating. Because it's not just his scoring. It's just the assisting, the way he spreads the floor, the way he's able to get people in their spots. You need that kind of guy against either of these two like defensive specialist teams. Like You need him to be able to split open the Jazz or the Clippers. Stop guys like Rudy Gobert or Paul George, any, anyone like that, and open up lanes that wouldn't be there for, for these other Suns players, except for maybe Booker. So him being out is, is you know, probably very, very comforting in, in its own way for the Jazz or the Clippers. Of course, you don't want a guy to be out with COVID, but you get what I mean as far as that's a big piece down. Yeah, now the good thing for the Suns is the fact that they did sweep Denver. So they get a little bit more of a break in between each series as opposed to if they took Denver to, let's say, six or seven games and then won, and then Chris Paul got COVID then rather than them sweeping them like they did. So that'll help because if he doesn't miss time, then he might just miss that first game. Um, now, you would rather not go down 0-1 to start against a team like Utah or the Clippers, but... If he only misses one game, that'll be your best case scenario there. You just have to take it. Yeah, I think if he misses one game, even if they go down 0-1, you've got a chance for still a competitive series. I mean, you can come back in, tie it 1-1 the next game, even if you end up going down 0-2. And, and a thing like that, especially if it's against like the Jazz and they, they're they the lower seed and they go down 0-2 away, but then they bring it back home, good chance to boost it back to 2-2. Uh, as we saw, I think, like every team do in this round except for the Nuggets. So it's a uh, it's scary to be without Chris Paul for even a game. But I don't think that 
if he misses only one game that the Suns are dead. If he misses the whole series, they might be gone. But one game, I think they can come back and salvage things. And being out with COVID, as long as his symptoms don't get him really bad, he should come back almost to full strength. It's not like coming back from an injury and, you know, you're kind of iffy on, on how your ACL is going to be now. Yeah, that's a good point you made because, I mean, we did have Chris Paul get injured in the first round, obviously with his shoulder, and he came back from that, and he's been playing fine ever since. Um, now, with COVID, it shouldn't really affect him too much because I think Chris Paul is vaccinated, so um, no, that shouldn't be too hard on him. I don't know his, like, personal health or anything, but if he's able to come back after game one and play well, not have any problems breathing or anything, I think the Suns will be fine. So moving on to the Milwaukee Bucks and the Brooklyn Nets. When we came to you guys last, Brooklyn was up 2-0 in the series, and they played game three as we were recording. And the Bucks ended up winning 86-83 to in kind of a meh game for both teams. Uh, you know, lower scoring than we're used to. Uh, KD put up 30 points and 11 rebounds. Kyrie with 22 points, 5 rebounds. Bruce Brown with 16 points and 11 rebounds. But it was 35 points and 15 rebounds from Chris Milton and the 33 and 14 from Giannis that really pushed them over the edge to get the win. Yeah, uh, they were accounted for like 79% of the Bucks points that night, which I, I know it's the highest percentage of a duo in like NBA playoff history. So it's a cool record to set. But in general, you should have more than two guys uh, scoring 79% of your points. Um, I'd love to see Chris go off, Giannis go off, but it's a scary performance whenever the rest of the team is, is essentially just dead. I'm glad they pulled out the win there, and it definitely changed the pace of the series a little bit, at least at that time. But yeah, great performance by both of them, but you got to have everyone else step up. Yeah, I mean, go through the point totals for every other player on the Bucks or Lopez, three. Drew Holiday, nine. Uh, Connaughton with two. Bobby Portis with four. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that's just unacceptable. And they somehow won this game, you know, barely by three points. Um, but P.J. Tucker, I know he's not a scorer, but you play 33 minutes and don't score. Four, but you're playing 15 minutes, you don't score. Come on. You got to do better than that. <laughs> so, you know. Hats off to Chris Middleton after he got absolutely torn up early in the series. <laughs> um, and Giannis was, Giannis has been playing well the entire series, but since they were down 2-0 and they got absolutely destroyed in game two, of course, they need that rebound. And they did. And then they went on to win game four as well. 107-296 on Sunday. KD put up 28 points. And the Bucks were led by Giannis with 34, Chris Middleton with 19, Drew Holiday with 14, and then P.J. Tucker did score in this game, 13 points and seven rebounds. But biggest story here is Kyrie getting hurt, obviously, only being able to play 17 minutes. Yeah, I mean, as a Bucs fan, I mean, I don't want to see anybody injured. Like, I, I would assume that Kyrie's injury definitely helped boost this Bucks win, and but it's not something like, I, it's not a thing I celebrate. Uh, I do think the Nets, are going to have a hard time going forward without Kyrie. They proved different than that uh, in the game after this one. But uh, depending on how long they're without him, things could get a little tough for them. We'll just see how far they make it. Uh, they could secure this series tonight. It just depends. But uh, this game was was is what, what I wanted. Uh, more than two people scored. <laughs> B.J. Tucker uh, was able to defensively hold KD down while he was on him. Of course, KD still scored 28. But when you think of KD, 28 is, is not actually, you know, that, like, impressive, which is <laughs> something to think about. Yeah. But PJ scoring 13 and being good on defense, uh, Chris putting in 19, Drew 14, Bryn with, with 10. You know, it's 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 like they, they actually learn, like, hey, maybe more than two of us should score, and they, they really tried to go out there and do something. So you, you like to see it. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to Nets fans, you would think P.J. Tucker assaulted KD, and maybe he did, but maybe he was just playing 80, 90s, you know, basketball. So, you know, <laughs> shout out to P.J. Tucker for being able to, you know, at least somewhat slow down KD. As you mentioned, 28 points is quote-unquote low for him. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do. 
And like you said, Kyrie being out probably did help the Bucks a lot. But I think the overall team effort, you know, having five guys in double digits, you know, made a whole lot more of a difference to me. And then we move on to game five. Now, going into this game, the entire, you know, realm of sports media was saying, KD, you have to be great. James Harden was coming back. But James Harden ended up looking like a shell of himself. But it didn't matter because KD had the absolute game of his life. So the Nets won 114 to 108 behind KD's 49 points, 17 rebounds, and 10 assists. First time that stat line has ever been done in NBA history. Blake Griffin with 17 points. And Jeff Green putting in darn near 30 <laughs> points, 27 points in 35 minutes. For the Bucks, Giannis, another 34 points, 12 rebounds. He had a good game. Chris Middleton, 25, 4 and 5. And Drew Holiday, 19 points, 8 assists. But it was just not enough. When you have KD going absolutely insane like that, playing the entire game, there's not a whole lot you can do. Yeah, let me give the Nets their pop before I, I tear my team apart. <laughs> but uh, KD, historic performance. I mean, that's that's he's an all-time great. Uh, Giannis, uh, in his press conference, said he's the best player in the world right now. Uh, he makes it hard to disagree with that sometimes. Uh, I know a lot of people would go for LeBron over KD. I probably would, too, on most days. But you watch a performance like that, and you're like, wow, maybe he is. Uh, Jeff Green coming back from the dead and scoring 27 on, like, 7 for 8 for 3. That's just insane. Like, how do you, you don't stop that. When a, when a guy gets that hot, they're just, they're, it's over. However, let's not talk like the Bucks were, were down this whole game. They blew a 17-point lead and then lost 108 to 114 uh, as Giannis and Chris and everyone essentially just died in the second half. Uh, they, they just It just wasn't anywhere near the intensity of the first half. Bad turnovers, bad fouls, terrible shot selection. I don't know what they were doing in the second half, but uh, hopefully they learn from it before they start their uh, game six tonight because it was just, you can't do that against a team like the Nets. You had everything going for you. Uh, somehow the Nets became the underdog in the series whenever everyone went out and <laughs> they 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 just, they come in and, and smack you. Like KD going off for 50, you kind of can't stop that. But like the other guys, especially Blake going for 17, you could just slow that down a little better or just keep up the pace with them and not blow a 17 point lead that you built. I don't know. This was an embarrassing loss. I say this one was worse than getting blown out by 40 because you had it. You could have you could have had the edge of the 3-2, and now you're down 3-2 and could go home. Um, there's not really much I can say about the Bucks after that. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, you win by 14 points in the first quarter, and then in quarters three and four, you let the Nets put 10 more points on you, and then you let the Nets put 12 more points on you in both of those quarters. What, what are you doing? <laughs> it's as simple as that. Like, what are you doing? Uh, I rattle off all these, you know, high scoring affairs for these guys. Giannis with 34, Middleton with 25, Drew Holiday, blah, blah, blah. Play some defense. I mean, I know you cannot stop KD, but can you at least stop Jeff Green? Can you at least stop <laughs> Blake Griffin? I mean, I know Blake has, you know, reemerged now that he's on the Nets. But my <laughs> God, uh, Jeff Green, pretty underrated for a lot of his career. I'm not going to sit here and act like he's a superstar, but. Like he came back from the dead for sure. <laughs> Put up darn near 30 points. I'm not really sure what the Bucks' problem is. Uh, I, I said this last week. I didn't want to act like, oh, they get to the playoffs and they just choke. Oh, Giannis is a choker, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I think that's just too much narrative getting into the sport there. Um, the, the media creates these narratives. And then if a player doesn't perform well in one game, <laughs> completely switches it. But Giannis needs to cover KD. I, yeah. I, I understand that Giannis has his assignments um, and he, he's he's listening to his coach. That's good. But Giannis should have the right to say, look, I'm going to cover KD. I might not be able to stop him, but I can at least keep him from scoring 50. All right. Um, coach Bud might not have a job after this season, <laughs> to be completely fair. Uh, three years in a row where you just have a weird collapse like this. Now, if they lose game six tonight, then look, the guy has made the playoffs three straight years in a row. 
It was more than that. But the past three years, he's had a really good team. But three years in a row, you've collapsed. Maybe it's just time for a new coach, change of scenery, you know, something. Because clearly there's something <laughs> wrong strategy-wise, performance-wise, that these guys just keep doing this every single year. Yeah, I mean, if if we don't get out of this round, or like, honestly, if we won a championship, I'm not sure how confident I am with Coach Bud being our, our coach anymore. He's just, his defensive schemes make zero sense. I've never seen a coach so willing to just allow people to shoot threes and, and just tear you apart. Or like, the last year, he didn't put Giannis on Jimmy Butler. Now he won't put Giannis on, on KD. And I agree with you. Giannis should step up and be like, hey, that guy's going off. He's their best player. I'm our best defender. Put me on him. Uh, and like you said overall, play some defense. The Bucks are a pretty like underrated defensive powerhouse. Uh, PJ Tucker, Giannis, Chris, Drew, especially Drew and Giannis, and then uh, PJ Brooke as well. They're all very good defenders. And it's like people like Chris and Brooke, maybe it's not seen as much. But they do have really high defensive ratings for almost all like the past three seasons in total. Uh, you shouldn't be be blowing seventeen point leads with a defensive team like that. Yeah, I, I guess it is just a coaching thing. But um, <laughs> if if they lose tonight, I could definitely see coach being fired. Um, now he'll probably get another job pretty fast. You know, there's a lot of openings yeah. right now. We'll get to that later. But I can definitely see him getting out of there. Now, Giannis did say, I'm going to take on the challenge of covering him in game six. Now, that doesn't mean that Giannis is going to shut KD down. KD is only going to score five points. But yeah, I think it'll probably help. Now, something we didn't mention, James Harden only scored five points, uh, had eight assists, six rebounds. It's pretty much a corpse out there. And yeah. they, they, they still could not win this game. So James will be a little bit more healthy this game. Uh, they still don't have Kyrie, but they got to they gotta win this game, obviously, because they're going to go home, but they have to win this game conventionally to me. Yeah, I mean, I assume James is going to do more than what he did in the last game, especially in, if he plays 46 minutes again. But they've, they've got to do something something different, especially if James plays better than he did the last game. You've got to do a lot more to, to secure yourself not going home tonight. But... If we get through this round, that'd be great. If we lose either tonight or in Game 7, I, I hope shortly after the I see Coach Bud box. <laughs> Don't blame me there. So moving back over to the Western Conference, we have the other conference semifinal matchup with the Utah Jazz and the LA Clippers. And they've met four times since we last saw you guys. So let's go through them real fast here. Game two, Utah won 117 to 111. Donovan Mitchell put in 37 points in 39 minutes. Jordan Clarkson also put in 24 points. On the other side, Kawhi at 21, Paul George with 27, 10 and 6, and Reggie Jackson leading the team in scoring with 29 points in a losing effort. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this at this point in the series, it looked like Utah was was firmly in control, uh, and honestly, it was kind of scary at the same time because you have the Denver Denver Nuggets getting smacked by the Suns, and here comes the the Jazz smacking the Clippers, uh, putting them in a two hole, which is the same thing the Mavericks did to them. And uh, yeah, at this point, the Jazz came out, put out another dominating per uh, performance. Donovan Mitchell went crazy again, and they handled business. Yeah, I think this was more about Donovan Mitchell and how good the Utah Jazz were instead of, you know, the Clippers being bad because they still scored well. Um, Reggie Jackson leading your team in scoring is not something you see every day. <laughs> but, you know, he was good. Kawhi was good. Um, Paul George was good. You know, I think he's trying to redeem himself from last year. But it just wasn't enough in game two. However, game three, absolute destruction. So the Clippers won 132 to 106, trying to get back in this series. Kawhi Leonard, 34 points. Paul George with 31 points. Reggie Jackson and Batum, 4 foot 17. Now Donovan Mitchell put in 30 points. Rudy Gobert with 12 and 10. Angel Ingles with 19 as well. But 
it was just too much. I mean, Kawhi scoring 34 and Paul George scoring 31. Just beat up on Utah. <laughs> this is another like example of a defensive powerhouse. Just forgetting that they're a defensive powerhouse. They didn't score bad. 106 points is definitely not bad. Uh, you have Donovan put up 30, 19 from Joe, 12 from Rudy, uh, 14 from Clarkson, 12 from Royce O'Neal. Uh, not a bad scoring outing. The problem is, is that they allowed 132 points. Uh, <laughs> they let Nick Batum get 17, which is, you know, you, if you have Batum go off for double digits, and, and as, as well as like four other people, you probably have the game secured. So this is just, that was just a tale of the Clippers came out, they wanted it more, uh, they defended well, they scored more. And the Utah Jazz just forgot to to stop these guys from going off. Yeah, I know a lot of people give the Clippers a lot of flack, and they might have deserved it over the past year and a half. But when they have games like these, they look like the championship team in the NBA by far. I mean, if when Kawhi goes off like this, when Paul George goes off like this, it doesn't look like anybody can really stop him. And we see that again in game four. With the Clippers winning one four, excuse me, one eighteen to one oh four. This time Kawhi had thirty one. Paul George with thirty one. Marcus Morris went off for twenty four. For the Jazz, Donovan Mitchell had thirty seven points. Joe Ingles with eighteen, and Bogdanovich with eighteen as well. But again, wasn't enough to beat the Clippers. And once again, it's the same thing. I mean, they put up one oh four. It's not bad. Donovan had thirty seven. Uh, Bogdanovich had 18. Joe Ingles got 19 again. The problem is, is that they just got outscored. Now this time, of course, they play a little more defense. They didn't get blown out by 30. But yeah, you have Paul George get 31. You got Kawhi get 31. You got Marcus Morris get 24. You just let all these guys hit that high of a double-digit mark. You're you're not going to to be able to get through it good. Not to mention Kawhi had like 31, 7, and 3, and then Paul had 31, 9, and 4. So they're they're doing everything. And it's just it's just overpowering these thirty-seven point efforts from uh, from Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert's. You know he almost had a double double in this one, not quite though. But he got to do a little more on defense. Uh, he's defensive player of the year. I think he deserved to win it, but he's he's got to stop these guys. He can't just get run over. Yeah. Now Kawhi mm-hmm. did injure himself in this game, and initially I didn't think it was really much. When the reports first came out, I saw, you know, replay different angles of it, but it did turn out to be a whole lot. Now they're saying he possibly has an ACL injury. So going into game five, we're thinking, all right, Paul George, it's like KD. He's going to have to step up for a game five. Um, They're on the road in Utah. Utah is pretty hostile just in general, but as far as the jazz arena goes, it's crazy in there. But Pandemic P did not show up. Paul George the GOAT showed up, (laughs) scoring 37 (laughs) points, 16 rebounds, 5 assists to lead the Clippers to a 119 to 111 win. Playoff P definitely arrived on this one. Uh, He literally did everything. I'm pretty sure he also had two blocks on the end of that stat line. Uh, I mean, it's just, if if Paul George does all that and you lose, then, then consider it over. But they won. And, I mean, it's amazing. Reggie Jackson, of course, pouring in 22, and Marcus Morris getting 25. uh, Again, hit 24 the last game, but essentially the same thing. Uh, Terrence Mann, 13, and a huge dunk on Rudy Gobert. Now, things like that, I don't usually uh, pay a lot of mind to, like, ooh, Rudy Gobert got posterized again. Because he's a guy who's going to jump up and contest a shot, and you're going to get caught sometimes. However... (laughs) You should probably try to block some more people and not lose in, in a critical game five that puts you down 3-2 to the fourth seed when you're the one seed. Uh, now, it's not all Gobert's fault. This is this is just a great team win by the Clippers. And I think that's the scary thing about this series. These past three games, the Jazz didn't really do much bad. It's not like they played bad defense. They could have played a little better, of course. They didn't play bad offense. The Clippers just came out and went insane. And I, like Terrence said earlier, when, they, when the Clippers click, they are scary, and they look like the they've already won the championship. Yeah, I mean, when Kawhi goes out, I'm thinking, all right, Jazz shouldn't underestimate the Clippers, but they just have to, you know, stop Paul George, and Paul George has been good this series. But, you know, with the whole Pandemic P thing going on, getting in his head and everything like that, you know, we may see a Pandemic P-type game. 
just the exact opposite. He went absolutely crazy in this game, looking like Indiana Pacers Paul George, looking like OKC MVP candidate Paul George, right? And, and that's what he needs to be every night. I know he can't put up 40, um, obviously, because Kawhi's going to be taking the most shots. But Paul George coming out like this, superstar, guaranteed, all right? Top, playing like a top five player. <laughs> this is what he needs to do every single game, regardless of whether Kawhi's in or not. Now, it looks like Kawhi's probably going to be out for the rest of the series. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Donovan Mitchell himself is also battling an ankle injury. So I guess it's just a war of attrition at this point. You know, which team can get through these injuries, get through these problems, and come out on top? Yeah, I think the Jazz will force a Game 7. Now, I don't know if they'll win the series, not with how the Clippers have been playing these last three games, but I think a Game 7 is definitely, you know, in sight. Uh, now, that also depends on how Donovan does. If they lose Donovan Mitchell and they still don't have Mike Conley, in, it's it's over. But we we'll just have to see which team wants it more as, as these teams kind of struggle through the waters. All right, so we got our last conference semifinal matchup with the Philadelphia 76ers, the number one seed in the East, going up against the Atlanta Hawks. Game three, Philly goes up 2-1 with a 127-111 victory over the Hawks. MB with 27. Ben Simmons had 18. Seth Curry with 12. And Tobias Harris with 22. John Collins put in 23-7 and seven for the Hawks. Trey Young with 28 and 8 assists. Gallinari with 17 points and Clint Capella with 8 points and 16 rebounds in a losing effort against the Sixers. Yeah, I this is where everything kind of flowed to Terrence and I's narrative uh, as the Sixers went up 2-1 and, you know, it looked very good for them. The 127-111 to victory uh, is, is a pretty good victory. This also, you know, was in Atlanta, so that's going into the A and, and shutting them up. Uh, yeah, everything looked very good. The Sixers clicked. This was another one of those like Clippers moments. Uh, Tobias, Joel, Ben, Seth, uh, for for Con Corkmaz, all of them going double uh, double digit scoring. That is what you want to see out of this team, and it makes it seem like these guys are really a contender. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much just how they have to play. I mean Joel Embiid doesn't have to score fifty points a game from the win as long as Ben Simmons shows up, and as long as Embiid shows up. Seth Curry shoots lights out like his brother. Heck, they should be good. Unfortunately for them, that wasn't the case in game four as the Hawks tied the series with a 103 to 100 victory. Trey Young led the team with 25 points, Bogdanovich with 22, Collins, and Clint Capella with 14 and 12. As for the 76ers, Tobias Harris actually led the team with 20 points. Embiid with 17, Seth Curry with 17 as well, and Ben Simmons with 11, 12, and 9. Yeah, this one is, is they had a big surge from the Hawks in this one, and, and you, you kind of expect that out of Trey Young. Now, I didn't take the Hawks winning another game in the series uh, after they won game one, but I mean, this one, especially with how close it was, didn't surprise me. Uh, the Sixers in the second half just kind of plummeted. Uh, they were outscored by 11 in the third. And and that's that's essentially where where everything went wrong. The game was pretty close from there on out, and they only lost by three. But a loss is a loss, and in the playoffs, a loss is not very good. So you had everybody click very well together. You just let off steam in the second half, really at the third quarter, and game over. Yeah, I mean when you get outscored fifty four to thirty eight in the second half <laughs> after taking a good lead in the first half, you're pretty much screwed there. Um, and we said this time and time again, like you got to play the whole game. You can't just play one half or a few quarters here and there. You got to play the whole game to beat a team in the playoffs. You're not going to get these easy victories uh, very often. And a team like the Hawks, you know, they're going to try to kill you every single game because, like I said, the Sixers aren't the number one seed. So theoretically, they should beat the Hawks pretty easily, even with Trey Young and a solid squad behind them. But the Hawks were not going down without the fight. And in game five, they did just that. 109 to 106 for the Hawks. And another collapse for the Sixers, man. Just absolutely disgusting display of basketball by them in the second half, to say the least. Yeah. 
this one was 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 pitiful. Uh, they looked amazing in the first half. Like Embiid did what he did uh, in in the previous game in the first quarter, and then they come out and they lose by three again after a terrible collapse. This time worse, forty to nineteen in the fourth quarter. Atlanta having the forty, of course. You can't do that and expect to move forward in the playoffs. You just you absolutely cannot. There's no way you get away with that. I, I so this one is might be another you know thing, like we mentioned with Coach Bud earlier, uh, he might be a reason why the Bucks have collapsed every year, and Doc Rivers has his own track record of collapses. Of course, you know more recently last year, three one in the bubble up on the Denver Nuggets, they lose that of course in the semifinals, and now he's in the Eastern Conference semifinals and. I mean, like you said, bro, it's just you cannot do that. You cannot allow a team to double you, you know, more than W in a single quarter after you go up by such a big margin in the first half. Um, you know, Joel Embiid and Seth Curry, they scored 37 and 36. And when you see that stat line, you're thinking, all right, they probably won. But when you watch the <laughs> game, man, they were the only people to score in the second half. How does that happen? That is like one of the most insane like stats things I've ever seen. Like just two people scoring in an entire half. Like, nah, there's no way. It just seems impossible. And like, I, I've even seen people that, that watch the game. They're like, even watching the game, I just couldn't believe that only those two were scoring. I also just would like to make a little little fun note. Uh, the 76ers uh, social media team at halftime, up 62 to 40, posted, is this when we're supposed to feel tired with a yawning emoji? And then they lost, of course after a terrible second half so irony yeah man i mean that's that's just pathetic i mean everybody on that team should be ashamed uh from top to bottom you got to come back in game six and you got one you got to win because you're about to be eliminated if you don't two as i said earlier you have to win convincingly because if you're going to consistently just collapse like this i don't trust you going forward in the next round uh, now, if the Nets win, I think the Nets could beat the Sixers. Uh, you know, even without Kyrie, if they keep playing like this, if you're not, if you're just going to keep collapsing against a team like Atlanta, who is a good team, like I said, but they're not the Nets, and you have such a huge lead on this team, you can't let up in the second half. It's just unacceptable. Yeah, it's just you can't do that. And if if the Sixers happen to make it out of this, they've got to understand what they did in the series. It's just not going to cut it. Whether they go against the Bucks or the Nets, falling apart like that, it's not gonna. It's not gonna give them. Uh, they're not gonna be able to scratch through out of that one if they manage to scratch out of this one. Not at all. So the other day, LeBron James, biggest name in the NBA, got a lot of people talking with a tweet he sent out about the number of injuries that have occurred in the playoffs this season. So I'll just read a little bit of it here. Quote, unquote, they all didn't want to listen to me about the start of the season. I know exactly what would happen. I only wanted to protect the well-being of the players, which is ultimately the product and benefit of our game. These injuries aren't just a part of the game. It's the lack of pure rim rest, rest before starting back up. It goes on to bring up the number of stars that have missed. And then he goes on to say, if there's one person that knows about the body and how it works all year round, it's me. I speak for the health of all of our players. And I hate to see this many injuries this time of year. He apologizes to the fans and wishes that they were able to see all of our favorite players right now. So the NBA has a response to that. Yes, yeah, so NBA spokesman Mike Bass was speaking to the New York Times and he said, quote unquote, injury rates were virtually the same this season as they were during 2019-2020. While starter level and all-star players missed games due to injury at similar rates as the last three seasons, he would continue to say, while injuries are an unfortunate reality of our game, we recognize the enormous sacrifices NBA players and teams have made to play through this pandemic. So, with both of those uh, quotes there from LeBron and from the NBA spokesperson, what do you think of this issue? I think it goes back to something we said a few episodes ago where, like, if it was this many players getting injured that weren't all-star, like superstar caliber, especially these guys on the big stage of the playoffs, then maybe it wouldn't be as noticed, and it definitely wouldn't be as talked about. But I do think that 
uh, I feel like I've seen more reports about even like smaller players getting injured. And I'm not sure like the injury rates being the same is, is very accurate. Like I, of course, I can't really discredit the NBA spokesperson, but it just seems even just from looking around the league and seeing like the smaller guys go down, that the injury rates are at least a little higher. And I think even common sense would say like a lack of rest is going to lead to, to more bodily injury. Now, I do think that, like the spokesperson was trying to cover his bases at the end where he was like, we recognize that this is an unfortunate reality and we see the sacrifice of our players. But essentially he came out and just said that to be like, you're wrong, LeBron. So. Yeah, I think LeBron is coming from a place of like, you know, slight anger here because, you know, this is something that he did say beforehand. Um, he did play in the finals um, back in October and they had the quick turnaround had to play in December and also because his co-star AD missed time in the first round, which probably led to them losing. So I understand that. Um, now, besides that, it's, again, it's kind of an eh point there because I think it's, I think it's more relevant because bigger names are getting injured. Now you mentioned that smaller guys have been getting injured as well too. But that's not really as important to the overall, you know, presentation of the product. Now, you had too many players getting injured, period. That's a problem. But it's more of a problem if you have, you know, top two guys on each team getting injured as opposed to, you know, the 10th guy on each roster getting injured. So seeing, you know, Kawhi Leonard, AD, James Harden, Kyrie, and Bede's been injured. Um, Mitchell's been injured. Mike Conley, Jalen Brown. Uh, Amber, Jamal Murray, he's been out for a while. So we've seen so many big names get injured and be out this year that could have definitely changed the outcome of the playoff series. And at that point, it makes sense. But, it, you know, it just happens. I mean, the, the only thing that the NBA could have done differently was give some more time off there, but they can't really control who gets injured there. Yeah, I think just to kind of like you know cool down LeBron moment but like I would say sure that the NBA did make a mistake with starting as fast as they did and I do think that definitely led to more injuries or at least more severe injuries however they are already you know the season next season is starting as it usually would so they get a, a longer break uh, everything should be back to normal and I think they've already kind of tried to repair their their issues here and like you said it's not like Adam Silver went out and smacked Kawhi in his ACL in the middle of the game it's not the nba like sniping people mid-game it, it, it's just it happens and it's probably from a lack of you know physical rest but at the same time we're pretty far from the season and people like you know these big stars have had some, some time to, to rest throughout parts of the season of course not enough but i think overall this situation should be a lot more cooled down by next season and i think some people need to realize that it, it is not Adam Silver single-handedly coming down and breaking people's ACLs. Yeah, and the thing is, like you said, they're starting back to, you know, back of their normal time in October, of course. Um, since the finals will be in, in July instead of June, like it would be now, it still won't be a completely normal timetable, but it'll be yeah. mostly normal, right? Because a lot of these guys, they've, they've been done playing since May. So... You know, for, for most of these guys, they'll be getting back to normal as far as their schedules and everything like that. You know, the free agency might put a little change in that if the guys are moving around. But I'm not really sure what else the NBA can do here. It's, it's already set in stone. It's already done. All you can do is just pretty much hope that the top guys don't get injured. Um, now, it kind of goes into the regular season. Like, okay, does this mean that the NBA shouldn't get mad at teams for resting their players you know Kawhi, obviously big load management guy you know with his knees and everything and all that we know why he does it uh, lebron is older so you know he can load manage if he needs to uh, but when it comes to these guys that in their prime or younger well should they start taking time off during the regular season to gear up for the playoffs more and how would the league really respond to that so it's kind of a you know, slippery slope there yeah, I, I agree. Like, you know, the load management things, they, they, they make people mad, but then people also get, like, the same people that get mad about load management would be like, well, why is this player getting injured? And so it's just a lot of back and forth with, like, fans and 
and the media and, and the NBA itself and the players themselves. And I think probably the most important things to take into consideration is the players' opinions on stuff. And the NBA should try its best to kind of conform to, not conform, but help the players out with how they need it. Because these guys are giving their whole lives to them in a way. I mean, they, they come there to play. They could easily retire anytime, of course. Not like they're going out and risking their lives. But the point is, is like these guys are giving them all their revenue. So they should try to help them not, you know, die and break their legs and stuff like that. Which I do think that the NBA in general does a good job of trying to prevent injury. Just this season was a bad outlier. Yeah, I mean, if it went the other way and there weren't really, you know, a whole lot of injuries at all, then what would you say there? You know, you would you say, oh, well, we we just got lucky there. Well, I mean, injuries are random. Like, they obviously, the more punishment you put on your body, the more likely you're going to be injured. But the actual occurrence of an injury is going to be random. So, like you said, I, I think the NBA is trying to do its best. They probably should have listened to the players and not started two months after the finals. But there's really only so much you can do because eventually you got to try to get back to a normal schedule. All right, guys. So for our last segment here today, we got our quick fire section. And first up, we got Rick Carlisle parting ways with the Mavericks. So Rick Carlisle has been a pretty good coach. Obviously, he won a championship with the Mavs back in 2011. He's been there over a decade. He's definitely a good coach. So where do you think he'll end up? I think there's a lot of a lot of people who are going to instantly be wanting to grab this guy. I mean, you don't see the Mavericks and see them as like a sign of failure. And when you kind of see a team, you see the coach as a figurehead. I think the Blazers are probably one of the better destinations for him. As, as long as they like keep mostly the same roster, they're almost set. We see them kind of in the same situation as the Mavs. But I think they have more power than the Mavs to go farther. And I think Rick Carlisle could push them there. Now, will he go there? I'm not sure. But for me, that's my, like, probably best destination for him at this moment as far as open coach spots go. All right. So moving on to NBA Rookie of the Year award goes to LaMelo Ball. He won with 84 first-team votes. So by a pretty wide margin, Anthony Edwards came in second and Tyrese Halliburton came in third. So do you agree with the voting there? Yeah, I'm a little surprised at how much LaMelo won by. And I said when we gave our predictions that I, I took Anthony Edwards as my rookie of the year, but I also said that I wouldn't be mad about LaMelo winning. I think it's well-deserved. Uh, congrats to him for essentially blowing the other two out of the water as well. Uh, great thing to have in your, your belt that early. All right, so next up for our quick fire section here, we got Stan Van Gundy being out of New Orleans after just one season so had reports throughout the season that he wasn't really clicking with the players and i guess that was true so do you think he'll go back to being a commentator do you think he'll go to the office job get another coaching job what's going to happen here i think coaching job is probably the least likely considering uh he took a team with multiple all-stars and they didn't make the playoffs i think they were the only team with multiple all-stars to not make the playoffs um He's not a bad coach, but I don't think his coaching style is fit for how the NBA is anymore. He could go back to being a commentator, and, and, and I think he'd be he'd do great. But, yeah, when you see how the Pelicans did, uh, it, it makes sense for him to go. Now, one, giving a coach one year is always kind of like, well, did he have enough time to get things going? going? But when you have the roster that the Pelicans had and you don't make the playoffs, you kind of have to look at the coach. They also had injury woes a lot this season. So I'm a little iffy on, on him being fired or them parting ways, but I don't think it's a bad decision. Yeah, I, I generally don't agree with giving the guy just. But in this situation, I guess he just couldn't really click with the players, you know, all year. So they just figured, you know, let's just cut our losses right now and move on. So we'll see if he gets another job. And now on to our last coach move as of right now, <laughs> Scott Brooks and the Wizards are no longer together. So do you think Scott Brooks will be getting another job? Scott yeah, Brooks is, is probably the toughest one of these to, to pick. Like, I think Stan Van Gundy has a chance at going somewhere, but Scott Brooks, I don't know. When you look at the Wizards, you think of failure, defeat, depression. <laughs> and so 
do you want to bring a guy who is a figurehead of that in as your head coach? No. Now, maybe he's, you know, really good at, at you know, a specific thing and they bring him in as like an assistant coach or something. I can see that. But I'm not sure that Scott Brooks is in line for another head coach job. Honestly, man, I really don't know. You know, they, he had John Wall for those years. John Wall was injured, of course. You know, Bradley Beal. And then Bradley Beal with Russ this past year. And, of course, he coached the Thunder for pretty much the entire KD-Russ era. So maybe that will give him a little bit of clout going forward. But, yeah, I'm not really sure how things are going to turn out with Scott Brooks there. And then last but not least, the Mavericks weren't done. So their president of basketball operations, Donnie Nelson, he's out too. So it looks like the Mavs are doing a complete overhaul now. Uh, we did hear that Rick Carlisle pretty much part of ways himself, but they got Donnie Nelson out, out of there. So how do you think the Mavs are going to look forward? Do you think Luke is going to get a super max? What's going to happen there? I don't know, but this is this is probably like the toughest move for the Mavs here. I'm sure, considering it seems like they did it as well. I mean, this guy brought them, Dirk, he brought them, uh, Luca, very essential in getting them both. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Luca said right after, I really like that guy. Uh, that may hurt his chances of resigning that or signing that Supermax. Now, I think he will still sign it, but I think there's a, a stronger chance now that he might be like, well, since this organization is just completely rebuilding, I'm out. Or at least rebuilding itself in the front, uh, not exactly on the court as we know yet. Yeah, Luca's only been here a few years, and he's already shown us that he's a top player in this league. He's going to be an MVP candidate every year that he plays a full regular season. But with this going on, your GM and your president of basketball operations going out, your coach going out, who's been there for over a decade, and he's won a finals. It's kind of looking like a little dysfunctional now. Mark Cuban is probably the best owner in the league. Yeah. But that might not be able to save the Mavs. So we'll kind of just have to see going forward with how they do. I agree. So that'll be it for this episode, guys. We hope you enjoy it. As always, this episode is going to be on Spotify as well as YouTube. So you can check it out on both of those platforms. This has been T Brown 31 with J-Bot the Great. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see y'all later.